hello everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us today uh, for this very important topic. My name is Odin Osdal and I'm the LA Regional Director for Club Z. It's a teen youth movement that's training the next generation of proud, articulate uh, Zionist leaders. Um, already our students have begun to make an impact on campuses around the country and I'll happily share more info about that uh, with links to Club Z and the work we've been doing uh, in a follow-up email um, from this webinar. Uh, today you'll have a chance to see a presentation from Club Z's Director of Education, Dr. Naya Lech, and she'll give you more insight how Club Z educates uh, on topics relevant to Israel and the Jewish community as well. Um, today's webinar is especially exciting. Uh, we've partnered with the Consul General of Israel in Los Angeles, and I'd like to thank Rachel Moray, the Director of Academic Affairs at the Consulate, and Jonathan Barrell um, as well, who I have the pleasure of introducing you to now. Um, also, uh, at any point, please feel free to post questions in the Q&A. Uh, if the panelists don't answer them while uh, they're giving their presentations, then we'll be sure to get to it at the end of the um, of their presentations in the Q&A. So uh, Jonathan is a career diplomat and he assumed the position of Consul for Public Diplomacy in August of 2019. He's one of the most senior representatives of the state of Israel to the Southwestern United States. Um, before assuming the position, he served in Israel's embassy in Santiago, Chile as deputy chief of mission. He was instrumental in the signing of more than 10 governmental agreements between Chile and Israel. He formulated policy, addressed concerns of the Jewish community there, and spearheaded social innovation initiatives in the areas of education, medicine, uh, women empowerment. Uh, he joined the ministry in 2016 after a career in the private sector as well in the areas of digital education and e-learning, so very relevant to our topic today. Um, also, it's been a pleasure getting to know him in the LA community. Uh, Jonathan, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, do you hear me? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Odin. And um, I want to thank you and your team um, and, of course, Club Z in general for doing this event and for having me here. It's, uh, it's truly a pleasure for me to, to take part in such an important educational uh, initiative. And um, especially today, the first, uh, the first night of, of Hanukkah, where we're going to candle the, we're going to light the candles for the first time for this year. Um, and today we got a special gift for, uh, for Hanukkah. And I know a lot of you maybe already heard, but today was announced that Morocco, the fourth country, um, will be joining uh, the, the, the process of established relationship with the state of Israel. Uh, we're talking about a normalization of the relationship, um, full peace agreement, opening embassies, in Israel and in Morocco. And this is, uh, you know, Hanukkah is the holiday of miracles. And this is not a miracle. This is the outcome of, uh, of a lot of work, but it's, it will have, I would say, um, miraculous implications on, on Israel, on the Middle East in general, and on, on all of those who seek peace. And it is especially important for me to mention it today because I think it has a lot to do with the topic that we're gonna tackle today, the important tackle of understanding anti-Zionism and why uh, we see anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism. Uh, and I'm so glad for Club Z to, to, to tackle this important issue and to have this educational program because, and again, this is something I can, I can talk a lot about, but in, in, in a short way, I will say that we believe that information and education and knowing the situation is the right way to fight it. And unfortunately, even though we are again, signing peace agreements with the fourth Arab country, we still have to fight anti-Semitism and we have to fight all sorts of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism from the far right and anti-Semitism from the far left and anti-Semitism from uh, Arab or Muslim um, countries and origin. And, uh, they all have different characteristics, but they all have also very similar characteristics, which is unfortunately the, the hate toward Judaism, the Jewish religion, the Jewish people, and now in the most sophisticated way, I would say uh, the Jewish state. But hatred toward the Jewish state and the uh, um, um, 
what they call anti-Zionism, to be against the right of the Jewish people for self-determination is anti-Semitism. And I'm, I'm waiting to hear Dr. Naya's, Naya, Naya Lecht's um, um, presentation, uh, enlightening us on this important, uh, important issue. Um, so again, I think I'll uh, stop here in order to leave enough time for, for Naya's presentation, but I'd like, again, I'd like you, uh, if, if anyone wants to, to to check in a q and in the Q&A part and, and ask some questions, I'd like to address it at the second part. Thank you again for having this event. Thank you for having me and Chag Sameach to everyone. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I will quickly introduce my um, friend and colleague, Dr. Naya Lecht, the Director of Education at Club Z. Uh, Dr. Lecht was born in the former Soviet Union and came to the US with her family in 1989. She holds a PhD from UCLA in Russian Jewish literature. Uh, Dr. Lecht is currently the director of education for Club Z. Um, and in her role, she's developed a very innovative approach to teaching the Arab-Israeli conflict, as well as equipping teens with the tools they need to identify and combat anti-Semitism. And uh, I've just seen her work in action. These teens are uh, wonderful educators in their own right. Um, Dr. Lecht has written and lectured extensively on the history of anti-Semitism and was a scholar in residence at Oxford University through ISGAP. Um, all that is just a bio, but you're going to see um, with her wonderful presentation how she has a great knack of taking the historical and contemporizing it. Um, with that, Naya, please take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Odin. Thank you, Jonathan. Chag uh, Sameach to everyone indeed. And Really the news about uh, Morocco is unbelievable. Um, and thank you to the Israel Council of Los Angeles for um, partnering and hosting us today to do this um, important talk. I'll just say a few things because the talk that I give is something that I give to both students and adults and community at large. Uh, the, the point that I wanna say is that anti-Semitism today is at an all time high and it is absolutely of dire importance that we do not shy away from it, that we tackle it. I also would like to say that at Club Z, what attracted me to Club Z and wanted me to join this amazing movement, institute and organization is our approach to education. And we lean into conflict, we lean into the tension, we do not shy away from uncomfortable topics. And today, what you will see is a presentation, and I'm not going to change it much from how I would run it with my teens across the country. So with that, I'm going, and, and of course, please ask me questions. Please feel free to chat uh, the questions uh, in the um, chat uh, part of this uh, Zoom. And we hope to get through uh, as many questions as possible. So with that, I will start to share my screen as I will be using a PowerPoint uh, presentation. So uh, one moment. All right, we were not very inventive with today's, the language, the title, but we were very transparent. Is anti-Zionism anti-Semitism? It is, let's talk about it. Okay, my objectives today as always, I always begin with what is it that I'm trying to do with you, with my teens. I want to, today to discuss the history of anti-Semitism and why it is the most potent virus, as I call it. I want to uh, teach you to identify it. And finally, I want to explain why anti-Zionism is the most dangerous form of Jew hatred today. I want to begin by framing our discussion. And by framing, I mean, how are we gonna approach this longest hatred as, as, it been, as it has been called? As it, is it racism? Is it intolerance? Is it bigotry? Or does it deserve its own framing, its own um, study? And I, and I do this intentionally because different organizations, different institutions, different academic institutions have a different approach. Uh, i.e. methodology. Our approach at Club Z is we're very, very much about treating anti-Semitism not in universal terms, meaning we do not believe that it is, yes, it is a form of bigotry, but we do not teach it as just bigotry. I want to just take a look at a word cloud that I uh, generated from recent messaging from like uh, an organization like the ADL. 
So for instance, for them, they, their campaign language is no place for hate, anti-bullying campaign, Holocaust education, racism, bigotry, intolerance, all not in disagreement. Uh, but if you take a look and generate the word cloud from their language, the, the word that comes the most is racism. And a lot of people have been asking me, why, why is it not okay to treat anti-Semitism as racism? Why do you believe that anti-Semitism deserves its own unique approach? And I think I will show you today why. And I hope you will ask me questions later on after I finish because I think we are not going down the correct path if we treat anti-Semitism as racism. That doesn't mean that it cannot uh, have the form or manifest as racism, but it cannot just be racism. And so I will begin today by taking us back in time. In this amazing. And I will ask a very important question, which is where does the word anti-Semitism even come from? I think it's a, when I started researching a few years back the history of anti-Semitism, I came across a fascinating um, piece by Wilhelm Marr. Wilhelm Marr was a German man who lived at the end of the 19th century and he had actually coined the word anti-Semitism. And I remember thinking to myself, that's very strange. Why, so right, these critical questions, why would you create a, a neologism for something that already exists, right? It's not as if there was no anti-Semitism before Wilhelm Marr created this word. So why was he doing that? What was his goal? And of course, because we are short on time, and I also want to tell you that in a normal Club Z setting, I would ask you, my, my students today, why do you think that is? And so we would kind of activate our critical thinking skills together. Well, to answer that question, I would like to just explain that Wilhelm Marr was in many ways a product of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was, if I had to simplify, anti-religion, pro-science, if you will. Uh, it looked um, at the world through uh, new sciences. One of those sciences was racist. Racism was indeed at one point progressive and scientific. And so it was very fascinating when I read about him, he created a new word to differentiate himself from Judeophobes. That was basically the term used for Jew hatred before. And he said, now this is my language, I've kind of paraphrased, I don't hate Jews because of their religion. That's not progressive. I'm a man of progress and light. No, I hate Jews for their race. Now you guys uh, on this call on this Zoom uh, session would probably go, my God, that's, that's terrible. But you have to understand you're looking at it from a 21st century perspective. At that time, race theory, Darwinism was progressive. And that is a very important component for understanding anti-Zionism. Once again, he wanted to differentiate himself from those who looked at Jews through the lens of religion, meaning deicide, that they are Christ killers. He didn't believe in these things, right? He was a man of science. And so in order to differentiate himself and then peddle this progressive form of Jew hatred, he created a new word and it was very successful. Now let's, we went back in history, let's go forward. And when I read about this, I decided to show you this. When I was in college and first faced anti-Semitism in America, that is when I first faced it, what people used to say is, I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm an anti-Zionist. Okay, so that, that was how they differentiated themselves from the old form of Jew hatred. And I remember at that time, of course, I didn't know Jewish history. I didn't, I didn't have the way to articulate, uh, but I sensed that that this was just a fig leaf. This was something was wrong. Years later, now that I have been researching it, I cannot help but draw the comparison to Wilhelm Marr. I mean, his story is so instructive for all of us today because what was he doing? He wanted to differentiate himself from this group by saying, I'm not a Judeophobe, I'm an anti-Semite. Today's Jew haters, and really this is what we're talking about, are differentiating themselves from you know, Nazi 19th and 20th century uh, Jew hater, hatred and saying, I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm an anti-Zionist. It's a very important moment for all of us to understand how language and how the evolution of language and terminology really helps people who want to peddle and once again market um, anti-Semitism or Jew hatred in progressive circles. Now, 
let's take it one step uh, further and take a look at this model that I've created. In the pre, uh, let's say pre-Darwinian age, pre-enlightenment rather age, pre the age of reason, the Jews were considered violators of Christianity. Why? Well, we were, we were accused of killing Christ, deicide. We were um, accused of not getting on the quote unquote um, salvation train, we didn't accept Christ. And so we were violators of the tenets of um, Christianity. Now in the 19th century, the age of reason, the age of industrialism and enlightenment, now we are no longer, the, the, the new form is that we are violating race, the purity of race. And, and that was, I, once again, I really want you all to internalize that this was progressive at the time. Now, when this is out of fashion, if you will, we are violators. The Jewish state is a violator of human rights because how many times have we heard that Israel and the IDF kill babies, um, subjugate the Palestinians, um, violate human rights at the UN? They're you know most violations against uh, resolutions against Israel. So I want us to keep this in mind and move forward. And I want to kind of uh, use the language actually by, the, by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who has an amazing article that he wrote years ago about anti-Semitism that he likened to a virus. Now, this is very timely also for all of us because we are dealing with a pandemic, but I assure you this presentation predates this pandemic. What do we know about viruses? Well, they attack the host body, they take over the host body, they can be slow acting or fast acting. They cannot reproduce on their own. And the last two are pretty important for us if we are looking at the analogy of anti-Semitism or Jew hatred as a virus. A virus has a unique DNA or RNA structure and they evolve and mutate. And that's very, very important. And remember, we talked about framing, framing anti-Semitism in universalist language as a bigotry intolerance or framing it as something very structurally unique. And if we are talking about it as a virus, it, the idea of a unique structure is very important. You cannot kill a virus or, or create a vaccine if you do not know its structure. Once again, back to this um, idea uh, that in each iteration of Jew hatred, the Jew was seen as a violator of the tenets that the society at that time held into esteem. So in medieval Europe, uh, where, uh, it, the esteem was Christianity guided by Christian principles, uh, post uh, enlightenment Europe guided by science, reason, age of Darwin, Darwinianism. And today our society is guided by social justice, human rights, and in each one of these cases, we are violators, according to the anti-Semite or Jew hater. We're gonna take a look today at many images um, of this violation. Now, I tell my students, and I'll tell you all today, really to identify anti-Semitism, you really gotta know your Jewish history, but we don't have time for Jewish history today. So I've kind of done a shortcut for you all and the shortcut is let's not take a look at the history of the Jewish people, but let's take a look at the six leading accusations, six leading tropes, if you will, that are used against the Jewish people. They're not only leading, they're unique. Remember, we're talking about a unique DNA structure, blood libel, world domination, demonization, dual loyalty, dehumanization, and avarice, greed, or money. Now, these are very unique to um, anti-Semitism to Jew hatred. Okay, let's take a look at each one in detail. Let's zoom in on each one. Blood libel. Blood libel, and I'm just making sure I'm on time. Blood libel is the accusation, and by the way, you would think that everybody would know this, and um, when I used to teach at UCLA, I taught a class for college students, and I referenced blood libel, and students did not know what that was. So we really do need to educate widely. So as we all know, blood libel is this accusation that Jews kill Christian babies uh, in order to uh, make matzah from their blood. And it originated in the 12th century in England with this boy who is being pre um, presented in an icon, William of Norwich. And this lie, this pernicious lie, it was so powerful, it spread like wildfire. Um, and uh, 
This is from PMW. This is an organization, it's kind of a watchdog, watch group organization that takes a look at what is it that the people on the ground are being told about Jews in Israel, Palestinian media watch. Right here we have a boy. Again, that's very important. It's a child, usually a child, a boy, referencing William of Norwich, draped in a Palestinian flag and this Jewish um, man uh, with the Star of David and the big nose drinking his blood. We go one step further. It doesn't have to be so much in your face. We have this image and all these images I've curated. I've been collecting from various propaganda cartoons and anybody who's interested after this presentation to uh, know the sources more than happy to share them. Uh, this particular one on the right shows the flag of Israel drenched in blood. Okay, now Jewish students at a Jewish day school in Los Angeles challenged me. They raised their hand and they said, oh, Naya, we do not think this is anti-Semitism. This is criticism of Israel, right? Is anti-Semitism anti-Zionism? And I remember having a difficult way to answer them. They said, no, they, like, we understand that this is anti-Semitism. You know, this really is clear blood libel, but this, it, you know, it's, it's not clear for me. And it was because of these students really that I had to think differently about how to package, how to explain to people in simple ways why anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And the answer is, is the trope, is the accusation. There is no other people being accused of blood libel. Of course, my students having you know, access to in the digital age to all information decided to prove me wrong, Googling, um, but they didn't, they didn't. They found that this was indeed only true to um, Jews. So once again, we see old tropes, old accusations being applied to the Jewish state. And this is anti-Zionism, today's form of anti-Semitism. The other second accusation, unique, remember, to the Jews is that they are controlling the world. This originates from 1903 in Tsarist Russia with the fabricated document called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Many of you on this Zoom call may be aware of this document, but once again, in, uh, when I was teaching at UCLA, because I taught a class on the history of Russian Jews, many students did not know of this. This accusation is that Jews want to control the world. Let's take a look at some of this. This is from a German um, uh, newspaper. Here we have, I mean, it's quite clear, Israel is a spider. It says Israel ensnaring neighboring countries into its web, controlling the Middle East. Once again, we are tapping into that unique accusation made against Jews. And this one, which is by the way, racist on its own, but uh, the idea that the Jews have the ears of, of the president of the United States, they are hanging literally on his ears. They have his ears, they're controlling um, the world. They're controlling one of the superpowers of the world. I won't um, pause too long on all of these images because there's a lot we can talk about and we would in a normal Club Z teen uh, session, but today I just wanted to get you guys to get a taste of it all. Um, oops, excuse me. This one is demonization. Demonization originates in probably with the third or fourth century of Christianity. The idea of that Jews disguise themselves as demons and have supernatural powers to sway people from taking the right path. This is a um, icon from a medieval um, text, a medieval uh, book. This in Russian says, Stalin has taken off his mask and lo and behold, there is a Jew with a Jewish star and he's a devil. Right here, we've got the president of Israel, I'm sorry, the prime minister of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu. Not, he's not just the devil, the devil works for him. So a whole other, and then conspiracy theory, we got world domination right here. And then of course, recently this idea that Israel has hypnotized the world, the idea that the Jew has the secret power to ensnare and hypnotize, it is, now it's just Israel, very clear. Dual loyalty. Uh, dual loyalty is a accusation. And I would, if I would historically date, when did this um, accusation uh, originate? When and where? I would say with the French um, emancipation of the Jews in France, with the revolution, where it was famously said to the Jews as, a, as a individuals, you give everything, but to the Jews as a nation, you give nothing. Now this, it, it, we can unpack this endlessly because it's a very important quote said by um, 
I forget his name at the moment, but it's a very important quote. And it shows us that the non-Jew, the outsider, always understood that Jews constitute a people, a nation, and inserted in the minds of the people that they, in their neighbors, is that, can you really trust a Jew? Where does the Jew's loyalty lie? Does the Jew's loyal, do, do the loyalty of the Jew lie to France or to Zion? Now it's, you know, um, I, I will reference this very famous uh, case in 2014 of Rachel Beta. She was a UCLA student and she was trying to be, um, to get on student council. And she had to uh, go through a series of interviews. And one of the questions was asked, given that you are a Jewish student and are very active in the Jewish community, how do you see yourself being able to maintain an unbiased view, especially when it comes to Israel? So she was asked, where's your loyalty? It's another way of saying. And I, I find this very hard to believe that any other minority, it would be okay to ask, an African-American student, given that you are African-American, are very active in the African-American student community, how do you see yourself being able to maintain an unbiased view, especially when it comes to race relations, let's say. Um, but for Jews, we have historically have, have to prove our loyalty. Um, and again, we can unpack this because this quote is very important and is absolutely important, especially in the Soviet Union under Stalin. Um, finally, uh, not finally, the fifth one is dehumanization. Uh, most prevalent in Nazi Germany, this cartoon from a Nazi, very famous uh, Nazi uh, newspaper, Der Sturmer, um, shows a Jewish man who is a spider. Uh, this is an Aryan woman. Um, he is about to ensnare her. Uh, this, I believe, is also tapping into blood libel because what do spiders do? They suck blood. But the idea that Jews constitute a subhuman race, um, this also the idea of the, comparing them to vermin, vermin, to spiders, to insects. This one again from PMW, Palestinian Media Watch. Not sure if you all can see, but this is a rat with a Jewish star right here. So dehumanization. I, I will pause and say that it's so it's so interesting to me that um, Jews are accused at the same time of being subhuman and superhuman in the sense that they don't deserve a place on earth because um, they don't have the pure race. But also they're superhuman, they control the world and they have powers of, of devils. And this is also very unique to Jews to be accused, as we all know, in the 20th century of being communists and capitalists. Um, and the sixth one is the idea that Jews, you know, that the, the Jews are greedy, that Jews are cheap. Um, this particular cartoon in relation to a Jewish man and gold, um, it has several origins. Um, for me, uh, uh, an important one I would say is when Judah sold Christ and betrayed him for 30 pieces of uh, silver. And so really, can you trust Jews? Because they could sell you out for money. And of course, we have our lovely Ilhan Omer tweeting, it's all about the Benjamin's baby in relation to Israel. So same accusation just now being applied to the only Jewish country. At this point, I would like to show you a, a model, something very uh, interesting that I do with my students. I show them um, language used by Jew haters. Um, and these are direct quotes from different uh, either tw uh, tweets or different websites. And I'll just read a few of them, such as um, Jews have hypnotized the world, dirty Jewish um, expletive, free Germany expletive Jews, Jewish pig, uh, certain news outlets were Jewish organizations, sorry, I should say, where Jewish organizations that produce Jewish content. Yes, Hollywood, Jewish media only celebrates Holocaust Remembrance Day. And what I do with my teens when I show them this and I say, okay, where do you think this, um, these come from? Um, where do you think these accusations come from? And then I kind of um, and pull a little trick on them and I'm kind of pulling a little trick on all of you here today. The truth of the matter is, is that all these are true quotes, but they don't actually say Jew, they all say Zionist. 
So Israel or Israel, Israel has hypnotized the world, free Palestine, expletive Israel, Zionist pig. So these are actual quotes. And I play with the idea of just all you got to do is change Zionist to Jew, Israel to Jew. And it's so clear. So I just want to, in wrapping up, um, remind us that the six accusations that are unique to Jews, remember we're talking about the unique DNA, RNA structure, are blood libel, world domination, demonization, dual loyalty, dehumanization, and avarice. And I want to take it one step further, and I always ask my students about intent. Intent is very important, because when you accuse a people of blood libel or you accuse them of world domination, it doesn't stop there. It just doesn't, because there's a it goes further, there's a consequence. When you accuse people of being, of killing for blood purposes, you accuse them of being evil. If you accuse them of dominating the world, they're untrustworthy. If you accuse them of being, of having demonic um, elements, they're evil. If you accuse them of, where do they, are they loyal? Are they, can they betray you? They're untrustworthy. If you accuse them of having subhuman um, uh, components, they're illegitimate. And of course, if you accuse them of having avarice and greed, they'll sell you for anything. And I say to my students, let's take it one step further. What, and I wish I could engage with all of you, but there's just so many people here today. Let's take it one step further. What is the outcome of these six accusations that lead to these um, uh, connotations? There's a shared goal. And the shared goal is that you have, to, if you can prove and you can successfully do so. We know societies can. We've seen this historically. We've seen this today. If you can indeed prove that a people is an evil people, an illegitimate people, and an untrustworthy people, you can deny their right to exist. You can deny their right to exist in the 19th century, and you could deny their right to exist on the world stage in the 21st century with Israel, with calls to, for annihilation of Israel. In the 20th century, you called for the annihilation of the Jew. Today, you're calling for the annihilation of Israel it, it, using the same accusations. And so once again, um, the goal, there is a goal. The goal is annihilation. Now, when I, when I give this presentation, a lot of people question me and go, come on, you know, Naya, how do you know that the goal is annihilation? How do you know that? Maybe, okay, maybe it's drastic to say that Jews are... Um, are secretly planning to control the world or that they, they um, or that the IDF soldier steals Palestinian children to then take um, take their uh, organs and sell them on the market blood libel maybe okay that's that's drastic and crazy but how do you know so I'm not a seer nor am I a prophet but I'm a student of history and I say the following I use Hannah Arendt Hannah Arendt was a very important philosopher um, who wrote about Nazi Germany and was witness to the Eichmann trial. And she wrote a lot about anti-Semitism. And one thing she wrote is anti-Semitism, unlike any other form of hatred, these are Sikhs, it has a goal of genocide. It has a goal of annihilation. And I started to think about that when I read that about uh, what she wrote, is that indeed the Jewish people have not just been enslaved or colonized. It's, it, it ends with Unfortunately, it does end with annihilation and genocide. And we need to be honest about that end goal for the anti-Semite. We do need to be honest about it. Um, sorry, just... Uh, so I, I talk to my students about having antennas. We, the Jewish people, all have antennas. Some of the antennas are really perked up and some of them have become dormant of no fault of anybody's. But we need, how do we identify anti-Semitism? We have to learn the six tropes or the six accusations. Because if you're only going to activate your antenna, let's say for this, or I'm sorry, for neo-Nazi propaganda, or only learn about uh, far right, let's say, or Nazi fascist um, proliferations of anti-Semitism, you're gonna miss all the others. You're just going to look at dehumanization. You're going to miss all the other accusations. So this is a Soviet era cartoon uh, or propaganda cartoon. It, it says Zionism in Russian with a, with a Jew. This is Zionism. He's a spider. Um, and these are the web. Okay. And we know that that is world domination. 
Uh, this is Trotsky, um, uh, who uh, is seen as a devil here with red, also Russian. Yes, it also means understanding and being able to see it from the far right, but I think we've done a very good job um, activating our antennas, especially in America and especially in the American Jewish context. I went to Jewish day schools and I, and I learned to identify it very well. It also means to know your, about blood libel and it needs to know about world domination when it comes to Israel. And again, blood libel today. And this, and demonization. So this is a uh, flyer from Israel Apartheid Week at Columbia University. And here we have an IDF soldier kicking a Palestinian boy. But if you zoom in, he's got horns coming out. And that is demonization. And that is unique to Jews and how Jews have been historically portrayed by anti-Semites. Um, I finish with a question to all of you. Is anti-Zionism today's most potent form of Jew hatred? And I, I'm just going to show you some more um, kind of disturbing. I left these kind of towards the end. They're probably the most disturbing ones and most recent ones. This was made by a professor at UC Berkeley. He created a meme, mom, look, I is chosen. I can now kill, rape, smuggle organs and steal the land of Palestinians. Yay, Ashke, Nazi. Uh, this is tapping into blood libel. And then we have a boy murdered by an IDF soldier and the murder weapon is Israel, the dagger. Okay. We have Ariel Sharon eating children. That's again, blood libel. So I, again, I'm leaving this question and I'm giving you my three answers, but it's something for you and to think about. Is anti-Zionism most dangerous? And I think it is because it is being weaponized by Jew haters as a cause for human rights. Remember the story of Wilhelm Marr. He weaponized the word anti-Semitism to peddle it to a society where racism and this new science of, of Darwin's race theory was, was progressive. I also think that Jew haters position themselves as being ferociously against anti-Semitism, just like Wilhelm Marr, while it's peddling anti-Zionism. And I think it's the most dangerous because of the space that it exists in, which is schools, media, the academy and international bodies of authority, such as the UN. So I do think for these three reasons, it is the most dangerous and we must, must activate our antennas. We must learn of the six accusations because that will help us understand that anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are one and the same. And I, if you noticed my, um, my Zoom name and Jew hatred, I've stopped actually using the word anti-Semitism. I like to use the word now Jew hatred and it may sound kind of abrasive and uh, not scientific, but I believe that at the end of the day, this is what we're talking about, whether it looks like Judeophobia or anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism. So I'm sorry I went really quickly. Uh, had I had more time, we would have really stopped and kind of dug into all these uh, images ideas and really activated much more of our critical thinking skills. But this is what I really wanted to impart today um, to all of you. And I thank you and I welcome all questions. So that is that. And Odin is welcome thank you. too. Yes, um, I'll come back in. I, I think you need to stop sharing your screen and then we can- Okay, the absolutely. Wonderful. And I will bring Jonathan back in as well. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Okay. So uh, I will. Uh, we do have uh, quite a few questions here in the chat. Um, I will uh, start off reading this one. Uh, so this is from Joseph Flashner, and it, he says Arabs and Muslims are also Semites. Um, also, Jesus was a Jew who would have been shipped off to Auschwitz. How does Club Z deal with Jewish teenagers who side with extreme left, um, who are anti-Israel? For me? Uh, he didn't direct it at anyone, but I think Naya- well, he's I for, He said, how does Club Z? So I guess it is a Club yes, Z. Exactly. Um, okay, I feel like there are lots of questions in that in that question. So I'll yes. just tackle one of them, which is, uh, what is this gentleman's name? Uh, Joseph. Joseph, you are absolutely correct. When I was on college campus, uh, anti-Israel activists would scream in my face, I can't be an anti-Semite because I'm a Semite. And not knowing my history, and this is why education is so important, I was speechless, right? 
here's the thing. Absolutely, this is true. A, a Semite is an Arab. However, the term came in Germany by Wilhelm Marr, who was describing a people living, Arabs were not living in Germany in the 19th century. He was talking about Jews without saying Jews. We know that anti-Semites do not have to say the word Jew. Stalin, his code word was cosmopolitans. That's how he referred to Jews, cosmopolitans. Because the anti-Semite realizes that in order to peddle, again, to market a Jew, <coughs> they need to find a way for it to um, attack the host body, right? Attack the societies, attack the, the institutions. And at that time, institutions were ripe with racist ideology. Again, it was progressive back then. So to those people who say, well, I cannot be an anti-Semite because Arabs are Semites themselves. Yes, but the term had nothing to do with Arabs. Wilhelm Marr described, was describing Jews. This was his language. Um, I know there may have been more questions in that about the far left, but I, don't, I didn't really get uh, understand it so well. So let's just maybe go to another question. Unless Absolutely. you want to email me at the end, anybody. Yes, and, and I'll include contact information afterward as well. Um, this next question is for Jonathan. Uh, this question is from Vered. Jonathan, what is the official definition of Zionism? Wow. Um, thank you, Vered. Uh, the official definition. Well, like, um, I'm sorry, I don't have the official one, but I guess if I look for an official definition, I would find, uh, I don't know, no less than hundreds of official definitions because, uh, you know, we are Jews. We like, we love to debate and to, uh, and, to, uh, and, and to get exactly into these things. So there are a lot of definitions of Zionism and there are even different, uh, I would say, uh, you know, different uh, denominations of Zionism. But without getting into all of that, I would say, I would, I would, um, I would go with, with the definition that I love. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, base, it's pretty basic. And I would say that Zionism is the belief um, in the right of the Jewish people for self-determination through a Jewish state in its historic homeland. I hope it's, uh, I hope I touched everything, but uh, I think the, 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 the important part in this definition, this, uh, uh, this ingredients, I would say that uh, as, as Naya said, that you don't have to be, uh, you can be Semite and anti-Semite. You, you don't have to be Jew in order to be Zionist. In fact, I believe that everyone who believes in the right of, uh, of, of every uh, people for self-determination should endorse and should support Zionism. You know what? The people who support uh, the Palestinian right for, for self-determination should also be Zionist, should be the first one to be Zionist, because why should, why, why should only the Jewish people be uh, exempt of his right for self-determination? So uh, this is my uh, definition of Zionism. Thank you very much for your question. Wonderful answer. Uh, the next question is from Shelley Naya. Why is Jew hatred a big problem on campus? Um, so as I said in my when I asked, if I, I left on my this this webinar today with the question of for all of you is anti-Zionism the most dangerous. And I answered and I said one of the reasons that I think is the most dangerous is where the space that it exists not in a coffee shop, uh, but in, uh, in academia, in higher institution. Why is it there? It is there for the same reason that Wilhelm Marr was able to, uh, to, to market anti-Semitism because today college campuses are spaces of progress, whereas progressive spaces, spaces of um, diversity and inclusion and intersectionality. Uh, unfortunately though, all my students share with me a very, very kind of haunting, um, haunting um, quote, if you will, check your Zionism at the door. Uh, you wanna be in the progressive space? You're welcome as a Jew, but you're not welcome as a Zionist. And that is the, a tragedy. That is a tragedy because for the Jewish people, Jew and Zionist are one and the same, right? And so they are pulling apart our identity. They are, pitting one against the other, which is one and the same. Uh, and they're doing it very successfully because they're saying it, this is not anti-Semitism, this is anti-Zionism. We welcome the Jew of the 20th century, but we don't welcome the Jew of the 21st century. And 
I, I think that in college campuses, um, being very much um, shaped by post-colonial theory, critical race theory, all these theories um, have found given space for anti-Zionism to flourish. Um, I'd actually, that question was directed at Naya, but I know Jonathan, you worked in the education space um, and I'd like to actually open that question up to you as well, uh, Jew hatred being problem on campus. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I agree with what uh, Naya just said and I think I think uh, that anti-Zionism is the, the worst and the most dangerous form of anti-Semitism. And I believe that the, the campuses is the main battleground uh, for, this, uh, for this fight. And it is dangerous because as Naya said, um, a lot of time it is hidden, it is camouflaged behind narratives and behind values that we all cherish. We don't only cherish, we believe in and we promote. Uh, the, the, the values of human rights, the values of equality, of peace. Uh, these are the same thing that we wanna promote and we wanna bring to the world. And attacking us with that is very, um, I would say sophisticated, very smart. And the problem is, and you know, we've been, we've been all talking now almost for an hour and the word BDS wasn't mentioned. And I'm very happy with that because the BDS campaign, the campaign to boycott div divestment and, and, and sanction Israel, is not the main problem. Israeli economy is flourishing. And even as, as, as I started, even our neighbors, our Arab neighbors are understanding the benefits and the, 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 um, the advantage of having relationship, economical relationship with Israel. The problem is the delegitimation of Israel. The problem is not in Israel. The problem is throughout the world with Jewish communities where a Jewish student going on a campus cannot uh, need to um, um, hide sometimes part of his identity. And Zionism is part of Jewish identity. It, it was always, have been, and, and should always be. And, and this is why this is so dangerous because they are, they are they, and this is also why it's anti-Semitism. They are um, attacking the Jewish identity and they are attacking uh, supporters of Israel by telling them you can be Jewish, but you cannot be Zionist. This is uh, this is uh, 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 this is wrong. You, you you just cannot be. I won't debate with you. I won't argue with you because you're Zion because you're Zionist. And I, I, I want to say to that that you know we talked about uh, that answer that this is not anti-Semitism. This is just criticism of Israel. Well, let me tell you that I don't know if uh, you opened Israeli media uh, in the last uh, seventy-two years. <laughs> but we love criticism. We are the, the best and worst criticisms of ourselves. Sorry, my light went off. Uh, we uh, see you. We see you, though. Yeah, you're you're okay, so I'll just continue. So, and uh, we all in favor of criticism, as I said. But uh, and here I wanna, you know, I'll, I'll, I wanna share a tool that was um, invented by Nathan Sharansky, and he talked about the three Ds. Um, demonization of Israel, delegitimation of Israel, and double standards. And I think every debate, and, and, and you know, we are here to educate and we are here to give tools. And I wanna to tell to the students going on campus, any, anytime you're being uh, accused of supporting Israel, you should ask your counterpart uh, exactly those three questions. Have you not demonized Israel? Isn't the legitimation of Israel? And isn't he using double standards toward Israel? And it's very easy to show how all of these three uh, come to life in anti-Zionism. I'll just give a really brief, uh, because Naya talked about, a lot about demonization, but you know, we are being accused of, of uh, ethnic cleansing. How can we be, how can we do an ethnic cleansing when the numbers of the Arab population, the Palestinian population in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, and in Israel itself is growing year after year. Uh, we are being accused for being um, racist, hatred toward Arab and Muslims. How could that be true when, you know, the, 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 the Israeli vision of peace was always to go and have hummus in Cairo and hummus in Damascus. And now it comes to life in uh, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and soon Morocco as well and Sudan, of course. Do you know how many Israelis are right now at that moment in this second in, in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi? Thousands of them. 
all, um, you know, going with, with uh, extending their head for peace and going for, for to do business and tourism and just to, because that's why we, were, we, we waited so long for, for this acceptance by our neighbors. So, uh, so again, this is for, for those who say that we are, you know, racist. I, you know, a few days ago, uh, the the the, food, the soccer team that I that I uh, that I love since I was a kid, Beitar Jerusalem, was purchased 50% by uh, Emirati Sheikh. And now there is an Israeli football club, soccer. Sorry, guys, soccer club in Israel, one of the biggest three uh, soccer uh, soccer franchise in Israel, with a 50% ownership by an Emirati Sheikh. Okay, so is this apartheid? Is this ethnic cleansing? What, what is this exactly? So I think these three Ds will help a lot of people in their uh, debates. And um, I'll stop here in order to give others the opportunity to ask uh, more questions. Yeah, we have quite a few questions, guys. Um, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, really quick, a lot of the questions have to do with, will this presentation be available? Will um, any of the materials be available? I will be sending up a follow-up email um, with additional links. Uh, so that takes care of about half a dozen questions there. Uh, this next question is from Jennifer Katz. Um, BDS and anti-Zionism has made its way into our high schools. How do we best educate the administration and teachers? How do we get, on, how do we get them on board with explaining what our Jewish children are experiencing? Um, they've had very little luck getting them to do anything other than have Holocaust speakers tell their story, which is important, but we need more. So I, I think uh, Nye and Jonathan, you both would have something to say to that. Okay, I will just say that being with Club Z, I think that we have a pulse on Jewish American teens and teenagers. This is our specialty, it's high school. And what I've seen since joining Club Z three years ago is an absolute malpractice that is happening in high schools when it comes to teaching Israel history and Jewish history. You asked what to do. And the answer is very simple, but also something that a lot of our people, parents have a hard time doing. Make noise. Go to the administration and say, I'm, I've experienced anti-Semitism in the classroom. By the way, if you go on our website, we do have a place where you can actually um, anonymously uh, give a detailed account as we are collecting them. And we can do a whole other session on the tragedy and what our Jewish students are facing. Every day, in, at least in the state of California, I am here, uh, what our Jewish students are facing. But this is what I tell them. Nobody knows that a tree, I mean, if the, you know, the question, the, the tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? If you are experiencing an attack on your history, on your identity, and you're not saying anything, there's not anything anybody can do. But we are there and we empower, and I'm always there with the families. We will work with you. We will help you to, to bring it to light. You must, it is your duty as Jews to do this. And it's a simple answer. You're right, administrators don't know. They have no idea. They, they're uneducated, many of them, especially when it comes to Israel, Middle Eastern politics. They don't understand. You are, you, your children that we are teaching are vehicles that can educate. In fact, we did. We had a student in Northern California who in his class, the class was on Israel and the conflict and the professor, I'm sorry, not the professor, the teacher was got a lot of information wrong, but it wasn't just wrong. It also left an impression that, you know, Israel is aggressor, Israel is ethnically cleansing. And our student was scared, but together with us, the, you know, he raised his hand and said, I need to talk to you, to, you know, Mr. Such and such. Can, can I talk to you? Okay, the teacher talked to the student. I'm sorry to tell you, but you, you've got your information wrong. And here, here is what information. And the teacher then had to go back to class and say, you know, guys, I think I got some things wrong. I'm really sorry. But nobody will know if you don't say. And, but we're here. You know, we're here for you all to be that support. But you got to speak up. Um, okay. Uh, next question. Um, this one's for Naya. Uh, Naya. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that one is too similar to another question before. I didn't realize it until I got to the end of it. Uh, next question. Um, how do we educate non-Jews on what anti-Semitism is 
when Jews themselves can't agree on what is anti-Semitic and what isn't? That question is from Jason Virakovich. Good question. Um, my answer to you would be, again, education. What, you, what we did today, this 40 minutes that I sat and showed you guys the six accusations unique to Jews, um, if my dog barks, I'm very sorry right now, but uh, it, six accusations unique to Jews, uh, the, where the words come from. This is information people do not know. They need to know. Regarding non-Jews, we have many allies. We have many allies and we should, we should bring them into the circle to, to be those allies. They're ready. They want to be our allies. They are our allies. Um, this brings me to a whole other, you know, this, this, this question actually beneath it, I feel like kind of festering underneath the question is the question of Jewish anti-Semites. What do we do with Jews who stand there and say Jewish, not Zionist? That was one of the other questions, actually. Um, uh, so I- Again, that I deserves that. its own course. But again, I will say only one thing to the person who actually, if somebody did ask that question, it is not unique. Jews, you know, today's Hanukkah, the era of Hanukkah, first night. The story of Hanukkah is the story of Jews fighting against assimilation, the Hellenist Jews fighting against the Maccabees, mm -hmm. the Jews fighting against other Jews. Terrible tragedy. Jews should not be fighting one another, but it's not new. It's not new. Uh, I actually, I'd like to pose that question to Jonathan. Um, your work in Chile, you had to work with a lot of uh, non Jews and explain. Um, the, the position of the Jewish people in Israel. Um, could you perhaps talk to that and how you approach that, those conversations? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to do it very, very uh, briefly. Right, we'll have to wrap it up. Yeah, um, Chile is a very interesting and unique um, country where there is, a, there is a small Jewish uh, community of around uh, a bit less than 20,000 people. Very Zionist, very warm Jewish community, but uh, in Chile, there's also the biggest Palestinian community outside the Middle East with over 500,000 Chileans declaring themselves as uh, from Palestinian origin. So the BDS and the anti-Zionist and anti-Israel movement in Chile is very strong. Um, they have a lot of representatives in the uh, political world, in the economical, commercial world, in the media, of course, and on campuses. And there I understood that the, the first to suffer from the anti-Israeli campaign are not the Israelis, because uh, Israel, as I said, everything, everything, everything works, economies, the econo uh, econ economical parts are flourishing, as I said before. The first to suffer are the Jewish community. And sometimes they suffer from violence. Some, sometimes they suffer from their uh, exclusion of the public sphere. And sometimes they just suffer for their need to hide their identity and their support of Israel. Um, and, and you know, I'll, I'll, if I if I have one more second, I want to share with you some photos. I'll do it very very quickly, just just for you to have an impression. I don't know if you see this, but this is this is the the shirts of the, I'm talking a lot about soccer today. This is, these are the shirts of the, a Palestinian club, uh, sorry, a Chilean soccer club, one of the biggest clubs in Chile called Palestino. As you see, these are the, the shirts of the players where you can see the, 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 the number one is in the form of the state of Israel. Uh, what they see as the state of Palestine that Israel robbed. And, and I wanna say that, uh, Thank God the situation in America is completely different. As Anaya said before, when you feel that your identity is under attack, whether it's on campus or in your, in your high school, you have enough Jewish organization, you have the consulate of Israel in Los Angeles here to, uh, to do something with it, to, uh, to not leave it as it is. Uh, in Chile, the situation is completely different and the, the fight over there is a lot, uh, a lot uh, more difficult. But uh, again, I want to show you again, these are just photos of organizations working in Chile, very liberal, very progressive organization, uh, adopting the, the Palestinian cause and, and the anti-Zionist uh, uh, ideas. And what interests is, and you can see that in all of those organizations, the map of Palestine is always 
the entire map of Israel. And this is another reason why in the end, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, because if, if you're against the state of Israel, if you don't want a Jewish state in Israel, what would become of the state that will be there? What do you think, how would you think it would look like? What would happen with the 7 million Jews in Israel if there isn't a Jewish state? So uh, these again are just uh, examples of why uh, we say that, uh, you know what, even if you are in favor of the Palestinian narrative of a Palestinian state, you should inject realism to the, to the conversation. You should uh, uh, endorse the Israeli state because we are not going anywhere. Amen, amen. Okay, guys, that is our ahead. time. Thank oh. you so much to everyone, please. You can email me, naya at clubz.org. Any questions? Um, this recording is going to be sent to you guys all um, after. Um, and uh, follow us. Yes. And for any of the questions we didn't get to, um, we are. You can always email me. And you can always follow up with us. Uh, thank you to the consulate for uh, this wonderful partnership. And hope to see you guys at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.